Or if you do bump it, just unbump it. Okay. Bump it back. 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 Bump and today I'm going to be talking about improving SSL warnings. And yes, I'd like to start off by saying I know it is TLS now because it is 2015. But for SEO reasons, I still say SSL. You can fix this. You can So today I'm going to be talking about uh, these warnings, which you've probably seen. Um, they're what the browser shows when something goes wrong. Uh, validating an SSL certificate. And there th imagine we're really optimistic and we're going to build the perfect warning here, the perfect security warning that's going to tell users what's going on when they encounter this type of error in their browser. The first thing you're going to want is you're going to want it to warn only when the user is actually under attack. You know, show users warnings at other times. Um, a, needlessly scares them, and B, maybe even worse, it trains them that the browser is a liar. So we're telling them, hey, you're, you're under attack, and then nothing bad happens, and in fact, maybe their sysadmin or someone else rightfully tells them, hey, no, man, there's nothing to worry about here, it's just that, you know, Chrome's doing this thing, <laughs> I don't know what's up with it. So this um, really devalues um, our security warnings. The second thing is that we would like users to understand warnings. So ideally, when a user encounters a security problem like this, they would be able to make an informed decision about how to proceed. So, you know, maybe they understand the risks, but they're in a hurry, they don't care about the confidentiality or integrity of the page, they're going to proceed anyway. Or, you know, maybe they do understand it, so they choose to go back. And the third thing we want from this imaginary, perfect warning world is we want to um, nudge users to be safe. This is particularly important if we haven't achieved the prior objective of getting users to understand. Um, if people are confused or uncertain, we want them to err on the side of caution, even though the browser does still have a high false positive rate, because in, in situations where there really is an attack, the costs can be very high. So okay, I just mentioned those uh, three problems, and I'm not going to solve all three of them, um, but I, I would love to and I'd uh, like your help in solving them. And today I'm going to be talking about what, what, we do, what we're doing to try to start tackling these problems, starting with the first one, which is how we can get browsers to stop uh, crying wolf, meaning how we can get browsers to stop showing false positive warnings. So the first thing, you know, when you say, oh, I want to stop showing false positive warnings, the first thing you have to do is define what a false positive warning is. Now when I started working in this field, uh, about a year ago, I sort of imagined that this is what the landscape would look like. That, say, 98% of SSL errors were caused by developers screwing up, and some really small fraction of them were real attacks. And so here the narrative is, okay, developers make mistakes, and so what we need to do to solve the problem of the browser showing hundreds of millions of false positive warnings a month is developer outreach. But um, as I'm going to talk about now, that's not actually really what we see. So this graph will maybe start giving you a, a hint of that. So we took a look at, the, uh, we instrumented Chrome to try to look for different types of uh, causes of SSL errors. So we looked for different types of developer mistakes that we thought would be common. So one is, for example, um, leaving off the dub dub dub, or you know, you go to foo.com, but then the search is for dub 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 foo.com, uh, or otherwise, you know, screwing up subdomains or wildcards, or um, you have a cert that's for some unknown TLD, or uh, multi-tenant hosting, uh, things like that. But the key thing to take away here is that if you look at this graph, none of these really amount to more than a percent of all SSL errors. And 
fact, um, we haven't been able to find any specific thing that, uh, from the developer error perspective, attributes a large fraction of SSL errors. But we have found a whole bunch of other things. So the way I think of the space is instead of that pie chart, that pie chart I showed you, the fairly simple pie chart that's either developer errors or real attacks, it's actually more of a spectrum with a lot of gray area in the middle, where whether or not it's really an attack and whether or not it's really a threat sort of depends on the, it's a judgment call, it sort of depends on the perspective of the user and the person who issued the certificate. Which starts to make this problem of how do we get rid of false positives hard when it's not clear what's a false positive and what's an attack. So uh, examples of things that are on the spectrum are uh, client errors. Things like the client clock is wrong, um, like people stuck on really old versions of Windows XP uh, might not have the um, uh, root store being updated. Um, Antivirus software often causes lots of errors if some type of um, HTTPS interception feature is turned on, it may not play nicely with the browser. And malware, which you know I'm calling here a, a client misconfiguration or a client problem because TLS isn't really set up um, to, to handle malware. That's, that's not something that the, the browser uh, can use TLS for. There's also things like uh, captive portal logins, uh, schools and employers, government content filters, and enterprising internet service providers. And I'm going to get into some of these in a little more detail with some examples. Then, of course, you know, there really are developer errors. Um, CDNs are a huge source of developer errors. Um, and things like expired certificates do happen. And then, of course, you know, there are real outright attacks. And unfortunately, we don't know how common they are. But I'm actually starting to believe they're more common than I initially thought. So the first example I'm going to go over is the client clock being set wrong. So a surprising number of people have the clock on their machine set wrong. There are a few examples. Uh, one is, what is it called? It's not Flappy Birds, but some uh, Candy Crush. I think in Candy Crush, if you set your clock ahead of day, you get like the next day's prizes. So people keep doing this over and over again until suddenly it's 2016. And uh, now your certificates aren't valid anymore because it's the future. Um, uh, you know, batteries also die, um, toddlers screw up your clock settings, etc. So we find that 20% of HSTS errors, um, according to Chrome's statistical uh, reporting, are caused by the client clock being set wrong. And that's a, actually a pretty conservative because we have a pretty wide range of acceptable time period that we consider correct time. But 20% of all HSTS errors are caused by clocks being very wrong. So here's an example of what we'd like to do when we're able to identify a false positive. Instead of showing a scary warning, uh, Chrome shows a thing just saying your clock is behind. And then there's a big blue button that will take you to your date and time settings to fix it. So we're not even talking about security here. We're just trying to help you troubleshoot the underlying problem, which is that your clock is set wrong. Captive portals are another problem. Um, you may have seen some, you know, like on the airport on your way here, actually. Um, I think that engineers see a disproportionate number of captive portal login errors. But, um, you know, when you're trying to connect to a captive portal, if you only have, say, HTTPS tabs open, uh, you refresh one of them, or you know, try to log into Gmail, you're going to end up seeing an SSL error because captive portal is trying to redirect you to the login page. Um, captive portal detection is a thing we have, and Chrome is trying to integrate with uh, our captive portal detectors better. So that, for example, here, instead of showing an SSL error, you'll just see something saying you need to connect to the network with a connect button. Of course, this only works as long as we're able to accurately tell that it's a captive portal login page. This isn't always reliable. Um, and 4.5% of, of all SSL errors are caused by these. Uh, wonky trust stores are another big problem. So this is an example of, I think, a weird thing that happened with Digicert, where there was some intermediate that was installed on lots and lots of Macs that expired on July 26, 2014. And so for the last several months, we've been seeing all these Mac users who haven't been able to get to websites that um, use this Digicert intermediate. And basically what the user has to do to fix this is go into their uh, key, key store, um, show expired certificates, delete the offending one, 
go to the DigiCert website, download the correct one, and then magically this error goes away. Um, that's what the, the, that's what the DigiCert help page says to do. I just listed off the instructions. Um, but that's the solution that, that you know, users are being told to do. This is not a very straightforward thing that most users actually can do. So you know, this, this one is a clear-cut false positive, and this is the kind of thing that we'd like the browser to be able to handle automatically in the future, instead of telling users to go uh, to the DigiCert website and do this list of steps. Um, but here is, we're now getting into a slightly grayer area. Um, there are, are websites that uh, are um, uh, ISPs or uh, you know, other people in the middle between you and the website that may have some desire to do something uh, to your connection. So this is an example of something I, I tweeted about recently, um, where I was on a Virgin America flight, and I noticed that when you went to YouTube, uh, Hulu, or a few other sites that stream video, um, they were trying to tamper with the HTTPS connection by providing their own self-signed cert. Now, I actually don't think that this was mali anything malicious on their part. Um, my understanding is that they were trying to um, they didn't want people to be watching YouTube videos, so they were trying to modify YouTube.com to not actually show you any videos. Um, now, I don't think this is the best way to do traffic shipping, but uh, I also don't think their um, intent was malicious. So this sort of comes up as what kind of false positive is this, right? It's not really a false positive, because this is exactly what TLS is supposed to do. It's supposed to stop this. But on the other hand, from the perspective of a user, they may not see this as a security attack. And in fact, uh, I don't know whether GoGo, when they set this up, themselves probably did not view this as an attack. Another gray area are things like schools and employers. Um, so many want to try to filter contents to screen out objectionable or distracting material. So here's an example uh, from our help forums where a user um, emailed us saying she was trying to go to Facebook.com and instead of getting back their DigiCert certificate was getting back this Wavecrest computing um, certificate. My understanding is that this is um, software that's sold to employers and to um, schools. I forget the name of the product, but it's not meant to be malicious. It's meant to be a feature for schools and employers who in fact may even, in many cases, could just go ahead and install um, a root certificate on your machine. Maybe they even own your machine. So, again, this is the kind of thing that TLS is supposed to prevent, but it's also not clearly an attack. So, I'd like them to stop doing this, because I'd like to stop showing users all these scary warnings, but on the other hand, unless they stop, we, we have to keep showing the warning, right? This is what we're supposed to be stopping. Um, Here's an example that's maybe a little less gray, but again, I don't think that they think that they're um, doing anything harmful. Uh, so some people send out reports saying that when they go to google.com, they're getting a certificate for suddenlink.net. And suddenlink is an ISP that provides, um, customizes the Google search experience to actually be suddenlink search. Um, and <laughs> Uh, this worked okay several years ago when Google.com was HD, uh, could be served over HTTP. But now that Google is moving to HTTPS everywhere all the time, um, there have been at least some cases where they've tried to do this to the HTTPS version of Google. And in fact, they have a way for you to opt out of this. Um, this is a, a help answer from uh, one of their uh, customer service people who's telling people how to opt out of this. So I don't believe that they view this as an attack. But again, this is what TLS is supposed to prevent, right? Um, it's supposed to provide integrity. So the fact that you know, Chrome can't not show warnings for this, but on the other hand, um, users may not view this as a, as a scary attack of telling them Now after listing all those sort of false positive and intermediate cases, I like to emphasize that there actually are some of the sort of stereotypical or clear-cut attacks that people um, generally think of when they think of TLS. Um, here's an example of someone on the Chinese Educational Network uh, who was trying to go to Google.com and instead was getting back a self-signed certificate for Google. Um, you know, in Chrome, because of certificate pinning, this causes a hard failure, meaning that users are protected, they can't click through the warning, but that's not true for all browsers. 
So, um, you know, these types of attacks do happen, and it's my understanding that, uh, unfortunately, they can lead to, um, not this attack specifically, but we know of attacks that have led to people being, you know, killed or imprisoned. And not necessarily to people who even knew beforehand that they had a care for security. So, you know, I'd like to, to answer the question of um, how do we stop crying wolf? And I don't have an answer, but I do have a proposal for what we can do to tackle the problem. Um, the first thing is that we, we, as a community, really need to define our threat model. Uh, what kind of behavior do we view as a community as acceptable in the network? Should things like that sudden link be viewed as false positives? My take is no, although I think you know, some companies disagree with us. Once we have that definition, we can begin to try to have uh, browsers automatically detecting things that we do think are false positives and giving the user a, a path to fix it or perhaps even automatically fix it for the user. And also, uh, for some of these things, the, the browser itself isn't going to be able to detect or stop it. Um, you know, it becomes a human problem, not a technical problem. If we want captive portal logins to stop causing so much havoc, um, you know, we need uh, captive portals with HTTPS errors on their own login pages uh, make things very difficult for us. Um, so, so some of these are sort of just business and community problems that need to be fixed, not just technical problems. Um, and speaking of human problems, um, the, next, the next problem is also another human problem, which is how do we explain the situation to users? So I just walked through um, a bunch of uh, fairly complex scenarios for what's happening when a user is seeing an error. How do we explain this to people? Um, people on average spend about two seconds looking at the warning before they decide whether to go back or to go forward. And before I get further into this section, I'd like to clarify that users are not stupid and they're not lazy. They just have other things to do. You know, right? Like, they're firefighters and doctors and parents. Um, and they don't have the time to go become security experts too, right? I'm not also a doctor. Um, it'd be great if I were, but I'm not. So, you know, but they still deserve the same level of protection as people who are doctors, I'm sorry, as people who are security experts. So when tackling this problem, we first have to define what do we want to convey. Um, the first thing we want to convey is the, the source of the threat. So this is actually um, a really subtle point. A lot of people that we interviewed thought that the attacker that the attacker was on the website, meaning you go to foo.com and see an SSL warning, and they would think what it's telling them is that foo.com is a malware site that's going to do something bad to them. So it's a name they trust. If it's Google, they're going to say, oh no, you're wrong. I know Google. Google's great. Like, <laughs> nothing bad is happening here. So what we want to convey is that the, net, that the attacker's on the network, somewhere between you and that website you want to get to not the website itself. The next is data risk. We want to convey that the data on that website is at risk. And just that, and just that website right now. You know, the files on your hard drive uh, have not already been stolen. So we don't want to over scare people. And we also want to convey something about false positives. Um, we think that people should be more concerned about errors on well-regarded sites like bankofamerica.com, not less concerned. We've seen, um, both from our own interviews with users and um, previous researchers, that people have sometimes come away with the misconception that, oh, Bank of America has great security, so I don't need to worry about this warning, because they're totally on top of it with security. So, like, I don't have to pay attention to this. And that's the opposite of, what, of, the, of the takeaway that we want people to get. So we compiled um, literature in this area and a set of best practices for what you should do to build a, a warning and apply them to SSL warnings. So we sort of made a grading rubric and we first applied it to some existing warnings. So the first thing is um, non-technical language. Um, we shouldn't be using technical jargon. People won't understand it. It'll just become a black box of a noun in a sentence. It should be at a sixth grade reading level um, that's what newspapers are at. It's a, a pretty valid assumption that a user may not speak English as a first language, but be browsing in English. 
they may actually be a sixth grader, um, or they, they may just read at a sixth grade reading level because they don't read much. It should be as brief as possible because when people see something long, they don't read any of it. It's sort of counterintuitive, but the shorter something is, the more, the more likely are that people are, are going to read some of it. So if you so show someone a wall of text, they're not likely to read much of it at all. Now, I just said that we need to be as brief as possible and a non-technical and a low reading level. But we also have to be specific enough about the risk for people to know precisely what the problem is. And we need to give them enough information to understand those three things I just listed. So, as you can see, some of these are sort of contrary to each other, which makes it hard. So let's take a look at some existing SSL warning text. I'm going to show you two. One is IE and one is an old Chrome. I don't remember which is which. Um, but this one says, the server presented a certificate issued by an entity that is not trusted by your computer's operating system. Um, uh, we're going to uh, go over this together with that rubric in a minute. The second says, the security certificate presented by this website was not issued by a trusted certificate authority. Now, here are some user quotes uh, about what they take away from these errors. Um, these are actually collected by previous researchers and, and published. One person took this to mean, uh, I think it says, a certificate is when security is up to date on your computer. So they thought that a certificate was like something your computer got for being up to date. And someone else said, um, I don't know if my information is safe. I don't know what encrypted means. Fair. A lot of people don't know what encrypted means. Sometimes even like second year graduate students. Speaking as someone who was a second year graduate student. Um, so let's take a look at this. These both had very technical language. They were way above a sixth grade reading level. They were OK on brevity. I didn't show the full text, but neither, neither one was particularly long. However, they were specific about the risk, and they didn't give enough information where if you understood what was going on, you, you could really figure out how to debug this problem. So we tried to design some text. Um, the previous were excerpts, and this is actually the entirety of the new warning text, which just says, your connection is not private. Attackers might be trying to steal your information from the website. For example, passwords, messages, or credit cards. So we sort of went the opposite direction here. We tried to make it so that it had a uh, no technical language, a sixth grade reading level, as brief as possible. However, the trade-off was, we're not as specific about the risk, and there may not be enough information. So we got better in one direction, but admittedly, we maybe are doing a little worse in the other. We ran some user studies to, um, not just in these, we, we tested a whole bunch of different uh, errors. And, um, we tried to measure whether people understood things like the threat source. So we asked people like, what might happen if you ignored this error while checking your email? And this is a Google Consumer Survey question. And we gave them a choice between a hacker might read your email and your computer might get malware. Aren't those both accurate? Aren't those both true? Are they? Yes. So they are. <laughs> and now you may get malware at any time. Who knows? Um, but we were trying to get people to choose a hacker might read your email. Um, that was what we were hoping, hoping people would come away with after reading our warning. Now you could really think about this and say, all right, well, you know, if an attacker's on the site, they could ask you to download something or like drop an OD on you or something. But that's, we're not really even trying to get to that level of nuance. <laughs> um, we just want people to come away with a um, hacker might read your email is the main threat we're trying to convey. And this is showing the percent of people who got it correct, meaning the hacker, the hacker answer is correct by our scoring. Um, we found that for um, both the older Chrome warning and for other browsers, um, a majority of people chose that you, your computer might get malware. And only about a third chose a hacker might read your email. And for Chrome 37, we raised that. We wanted to get the hacker answer, and we raised it to about 50%. But keep, there are two tricks this year. So we were able to, to bring it up to a tie, where people were basically caught tossing a coin, tossing a coin between the two answers. Um, so we like to tell ourselves we improved here, and I like to think we did, but you know, there's still a long way to go here. And 
Uh, we also tried to measure uh, if people understood the data at risk. So we asked, if you ignored this error on bankofamerica.com, what information might a hacker be able to see? And we gave a bunch of uh, choices, of photos, documents, bank statements, movies, and all of the above. We wanted people to choose bank statements, because we were hoping that people would understand that the stuff on bankofamerica.com is at risk, but not all these other things. And we asked the same question for different types of websites. We asked it for Facebook, we asked it for, um, I think, some uh, Amazon, some streaming services, etc. And uh, consistently, for all the different types of websites we asked about, people tended to overestimate the risk. The correct answer of bank, and in this, you can see, you know, between, 18, uh, between 14 and 20 percent of people chose um, the bank statements, but a majority of people um, chose everything. They thought everything was at risk. Mm -hmm. Aren't you falling into the same issue that you identified earlier by giving them too many choices? I say that because when I was working for a school doing research in this area, one of the things we discovered is if you give a user less than three choices, it's really not enough. If you give a user more than three choices, then generally they'll pick anything. And so you may have given them too much information and therefore lose the results and not getting it because they're just choosing anything to move on rather than actually reading everything that's there. That's a good point. Um, and that's a, a totally valid criticism of the methodology. Uh, we did try it though with different sets of answers. Uh, we actually ran like 40 variants of this question trying to get it right. And we got about the same, like, the same response regardless of what, of what question. Um, and in fact, for our wording, if you remember, we had a list of like, for example, credit card information, email, or something else. So when we asked a few people after getting these results um, why they thought that, if they put in that list, like in the morning, it says a list of things that might be at risk. And so several of these are on that list, and so they're picking everything. So they weren't reasoning about it based on the origin. They were just going based on that, that list of stuff that we put in the morning. So. Unfortunately, um, nothing has really succeeded yet. We, we think we've made some progress, at least over the old version of the Chrome Warning, um, based on both uh, some of these results and also from talking to people. Um, but we're still a long way away from actually getting to, to a place where people could really have informed consent, or be make, making an informed decision when they're choosing whether to proceed or go back when faced with an SSR. So how to do better is still an open problem. So given that we have not succeeded to have an army of super well-informed users, unfortunately, um, we want to do the next best thing, which is to nudge users to heed our advice, which is to stay safe when presented with this type of situation. So again, we consulted best practices, and we call these three things together opinionated design. So the idea here is that the warning should give users a hint of what they're supposed to be doing when faced with this decision. So we think that people trust the browser, the browser is an authority source, and if we, we kind of tell them what they should be doing, that we hope they'll do it. Now how do you go about doing that? The first is to provide a clear instruction. The second is to make the preferred choice, the correct choice, um, more visually attractive. And also, on the other hand, to make the not preferred choice, meaning in this case to proceed to the website, um, less attractive. So let's take a look at what the old Chrome SSL warning looks like. Um, here we had, there was a direct statement saying you should not proceed. So okay. But the two choices are proceed anyway and back to safety. They look the same. They're right next to each other. We're not making a clear suggestion as to which one you should be clicking, especially if you haven't you know, read all the way down and read this. Imagine most users are going to read the headline text and just the buttons. And from looking at these buttons, you don't really have a great idea of which one you're supposed to click on if you don't really understand what they mean. So, a little bit to work on here. So, this is the uh, new version where we've applied opinionated design. So, the uh, button that we want them to choose is a big blue primary action button that says back to safety on it. It's meant to look really juicy and appealing. If you want to proceed to the warning, you have to first click on advanced. Then at the bottom, there's a link that says proceed to the website with unsafe next to it in parentheses. 
So given the contrast between these two, it should be pretty clear which one the browser is saying is the primary action and which one is the not preferred action. So uh, we told ourselves, great, we've done a great job on this. But um, you know, putting up a grading rubric that I've graded myself isn't necessarily the best way to know whether it worked. So we put together a field trial in Chrome. So the way this works is in uh, Chrome, Canary, and developer, being sort of the, the pre-official release versions of Chrome, we ran an A-B test where uh, users had some uh, random chance of falling into one of its experimental buckets instead of seeing the normal SSL warning. So there were three conditions. The first was the um, existing Chrome SSL warning. This is the old warning, the one that had the, the parallel buttons. There was a, a middle choice, which was actually um, the, the old design, where things are, are laid out next to each other, but using the new text that we settled on uh, in, in the last section of the talk. And the third one was the new text and the new layout. The reason why we have that middle condition is because if we just did the old versus the new, you wouldn't be able to tell if it was the text or the design that caused a change. So we had to run the condition in the middle also. And um, here's what we found. The adherence rate, meaning the rate at which people heeded our advice, was about 30% for both of the uh, non-opinionated designs to talk to. But about 60% of people um, chose to stay safe with the more opinionated design. So essentially, sort of just by changing the layout of the page, by strongly preferring one choice to the other, we nearly doubled the rate at which people chose to stay safe. Is this among all SSL errors, or ones where you think there's a reasonably high chance they're not like obvious to the user, false positive? Um, so, I think we did this before we started making the more helpful ones, like the clock, etc. So this was from among all, all warnings. But with that being said, um, it's six months later, and we're actually seeing about a 62% adherence rate in the field. Um, with that being said, in the meantime, things like the more helpful bad clock and the um, more helpful cap captive portal error have started rolling out. Um, but uh, I'm pretty happy with this, especially because, to be honest, I thought after the first month or two that the adherence rate was going to drop. And I was really su pleasantly surprised that it wasn't just a novelty effect. The adherence rate has stayed high. <clears throat> so, um, the, the conclusion that we're drawing from this is that opinion and design, meaning if a user just looks at the page and has no idea what the page is saying, they can still tell what they're supposed to be doing, that type of design for a security warning can work, even when unfortunately it changes to text as maybe only having a marginal improvement on comprehension and um, not changing adherence at all. Oh, and by the way, I'd like to uh, do a shout out to Firefox, who also has a fairly opinionated warning. You have to click, click four times, I think, to say you really want to proceed to a website. So I think people get the idea by the fourth click that Firefox does not want them to do that. Um, so in conclusion, uh, here is my to-do list that I, I sort of put together at the start of the talk. Uh, the first is that we want to warn only when under attack. The second is that we want users to understand warnings. And the third is that we want users to follow our warning advice. Now I think we're doing okay on the third one. I'm pretty happy actually with 62% of people um, choosing to heed the warning. I don't really expect it to ever get up to 100%. To be honest, a lot of the time it really is a false positive. Um, so I don't expect it to ever be 100% you know, adherence. So I'm pretty happy you know, with, with more, than, more than half of people choosing to um, adhere the warning. But the first two, stu first two still need more work. Um, the first, you know, the main challenge is just that we have all these things in the network, and also products like um, AV software that you know are supposed to be helping people, but most of the time are, are just are causing huge, I mean, hundreds of millions of, of these warnings for people, where you know they're confused about them and they don't know what to do, and the browser can't really stop or fix them. Um, you know, it's only the software companies that are deploying these products that are the ones that can really uh, stop stop with the behavior that causes the warnings. And also, um, 
there's still work to go in getting users to understand warnings. And I think that the second goal of making users understand warnings would be easier once sort of the false positive problem were tackled. Because if we could say, like really say, these only happen when there are attacks and not, oh, these happen when Chrome is screwing up, then I think people might have a, a better sense of what's really happening on the computer because they trust it more. And that's all I got. Um, I'd like to thank my teammates. Uh, a lot of people work on this, not just me. Um, got a, the Chrome security team is pretty big, and I think Priest is going to be talking more <laughs> about our team tomorrow. Are there any questions? So, um, the beauty of uh, AJSTS is the fact that you provided the um, decision between stay open and stay close to the user. What I see here is pretty much a fail open or fail open with four clicks in order to see. Uh, are you considering something like uh, providing this decision whether to fail open or fail close, close to the developer of the website to know the content device? That's a really good question. Um, you know, if we want to nudge, pe another way of saying it is if we want to nudge people, why don't we just make it so they can't proceed to the warning ever? No, uh, actually, uh, leave the developers of the website to decide whether to proceed or not. Well, HSTS kind of does that. If you opt into HS, yeah, if you opt into HSTS, then you yeah. can't move forwards. But um, there are some some subtleties to that. Um, the first is um, there are way more HSTS warnings, I think, than than people expect when they initialize it on their website because developer errors are not the only thing that's causing them. So when you turn on HSTS for your website, people are still going to see errors, and they're going to get frustrated, they're going to get mad, you know, they're going to complain to you, they're going to complain to us, they're going to switch browsers and look for one that um, will let them get around the HSTS warning. So it's not, so, so we still want to try to convince people that they don't want to proceed, even if we've taken away the button, if that makes any sense. Um. I saw a slide where you said uh, real attacks may be more common than we think. Is there any data there? Um, unfortunately, no. So you see. I remain pretty skeptical that real attacks ever do this. Uh, it depends on who well, you're attacking. Why don't you go to Beijing right now and try to open up mail.yahoo.com? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or Facebook. Or Facebook? Yeah, there's, yeah. there's some. Sorry. Was the question about some data? There is data for some data. That there's data, there. there's just not data they're going to talk about. I'll talk about it, yes. Okay. Many countries are actively in the middle of the major internet companies. You Often with self-signed certificates. Yeah. And that's because in these countries, often the browsers don't even do basic verification, or the failure rate of people clicking through is so incredibly high that it's still worth it. And so they're gathering up millions of credentials. What, what I expected was uh, malicious uh, but the attacker would just use plain text so that you never see a SSL cert error and they expect the user to not notice that it's plain text. You would think that, but they don't. Okay. And they we don't made, for a couple of reasons. Just, partly because, partly I mean, you have to do a lot of rewriting to make that work. It's we, way easier to make people click it through mm -hmm. than to rewrite every JavaScript include and every include to make sure it's an HTTP link. So, so suppose, suppose we made this perfect, wouldn't they just do the plain text thing? <laughs> well, you have to convince the user to drop down the plain text. You know, if they go to an HTTPS link, what's the attacker going to do? Right. Yeah, but so most people... And that's why you pay HSTS, is that yeah. if you go to http.google.com, if Google already gave you HSTS, the browser refuses to go to HTTP. Right, you go straight to HTTPS, and then the attacker can't get on the wire. Right? Yeah, a lot of the high-value targets are using HSTS now. Okay. Uh, so, uh, Google is in the position of having these two platforms where Chrome is the default browser and then many others where it's an optional browser. And my, my experience is that there's a demographic who only uses the default browser, whichever that is on their Did you compare those demographics? That's a really, uh, that's a really good question. Um, so, when we started off with this, we were comparing um, uh, Firefox's click-through rate, which um, our adherence rate, which was uh, about 66% uh, to Chrome's, which at the time was 30%. Uh, and we we're seeing this huge difference, and we wondered what was causing it, and whether part of it might be the user base. So we actually ran the Firefox warning in Chrome. Of course, we substituted with their permission. Thank you. 
um, we substituted uh, you know, Firefox, the string Firefox for Chrome, but we ran with their warning. And we found that um, about half of the gap could be accounted for, but the other half we thought was just the user base. So um, I have the opposite conclusion. I think this is great work, and I'm glad you guys did it. I think my conclusion is, with all of the work you did and all of the resources you put to it, the best you can do is that 38% of your users are still using them insecurely, and that you should not provide them the choice because they're not qualified. And when you, when you look at that, that gradient of the things that happened, one of the reasons why a lot of those things in the middle still exist is because people can click through and they can get around it. And if everything, you know, Google obviously accepts this because you guys hard pin and hard fail, right? And so you're willing for yourselves to hard fail, but then you're not going to give that protection to companies that don't know Adam Langley and don't know how, you know, about the, how Chromium pinning works. And... Honestly, I don't think that's I don't think that's appropriate. I don't think it's morally acceptable, and I think this your research has demonstrated that you can't give this choice to users. That if somebody wants this choice, they have to be able to go to about flags and yeah, turn it on. Developer mode or something. Yeah, developer mode or something. That for normal people, you should not give them the choice for, especially like the IRS C name mismatch and stuff. Like I think it's great with the clock and like figuring out those little corner cases that you can figure out. But for everything else, a lot of the stuff in that middle, if you hard fail, would disappear because it just wouldn't work. And so somebody would have to fix it. So I guess from a product standpoint, if you do that, you guys are going to the browser, right? I don't know. I mean, most of their websites. They, they will. They will. So, they will. Right. And I think that's the price you guys pay until Firefox does it too. And it does, so, if it means it drives people so to shake browsers. If, I could do a sh if we could do a shake, probably with IE and, and Firefox, yeah. possibly. But I think unless that would happen, it's it's a really hard thing for the first. And I think Chrome is actually pretty good at like taking the first step and getting bitten sometimes. But it is one of those interesting things which, when working on a product, it's it's kind of like. Um, I agree with you, there. I also know what would happen. Yeah, I, I disagree because we're at a point where it's now, Google, Yahoo, Facebook, Twitter, all hard failing. So you're talking about a huge chunk of the internet hard failing. If it was going to push people to the browsers, it would happen right now. So, and so, so we, they do. Um, people do switch to get access to them, unfortunately. Yeah. And, and, then it, and then it comes back to the websites for us to push people back onto Chrome and Firefox, right? Like, we're starting to do looking at user agents and telling people we're not going to serve you because you're in a user agent that doesn't do SSL verification and stuff like that. So, but I, I just, I mean, the, the conclusion here is that you can't give them the choice. And I mean, in, in which of those 38% is it appropriate for them actually to, like, is, was Ron Revesque 38% of your, your I mean, survey? But, okay, so, but is that our choice to make, right? People do yes. things that are unsafe all the time, right? People, like, jump off cliffs, and they smoke even they have a family history of cancer, and they go around the train signs near my house. Um, so some people have a higher risk threshold than others. This, is, this isn't like this. This is like putting a red button on the dashboard of a Honda Civic, that says do not push this red button, and if you do it, makes the gas tank blow up, right? Like, it's yeah, not. No, it's not. not. Yeah, it's, it's not. not. Yeah. It's not. Yeah. It's not. I have dozens of internal browsers. Yeah. I have no. dozens of internal web servers that may yeah. not have a and public how, certificate. How fast, if it hard failed, how fast would those get fixed? They would get fixed right They'd away. they get fixed but in a day. You know what? That's the problem. That, that's <laughs> the reality of it is that they don't yeah. have public certs, and you know what, I'm not going to go track them down and get them for them, right? Yeah, so I have been, I, uh, I, I feel like this is kind of at the heart of whether people are libertarians or like they think that a government should sort of be more protective. <laughs> and it is, a, it is a really, like depending on where you fall on that spectrum, and I think um, I'm actually happy to see more paternalistic. Uh, okay. decisions for browsers, but I don't think, I don't know if you can be extreme, I don't know. It's just, it's just silly, because you're like, yeah. oh, we can lead the horse to water. When you have the ability just to inject the water straight into the horse. Right? <laughs> 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 That's a question for another audience. I, I, I like this discussion, but I think there may be people who are other questions. Other questions. Other questions. And then we can maybe get back to it. Yeah. How, how do you do captive portal detection? Because that sounds really scary. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 Um, there's an HTTP where all the Chrome things, um, or the, so first of all, some operating systems do it, and we rely on the operating, operating system, like I think that does it. Um, or others, like we have an HTTP URL that we ping, and we look to see what it, like what happens, like what, what, what gets returned. And yes, an attacker could totally do that, but you can't click through the captive portal warning. If we think it's a captive portal, there's no way to get to the content except to make it stop acting like a captive portal. So, 
Are there any more factual? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Commentary is also welcome, but uh, what time do we have until I think? Yeah, just one quick question. There's a couple of browsers, security privacy, and storing with them. I saw that's damn question. <laughs> um, when the browser vendors have gotten together to do a security privacy feature collectively as one, it has happened in a few cases over the years, like the elite color history ceiling one. You guys all seem to do it at the same time. What causes that? Because that's kind of what Alex is talking about. It's the market share war versus privacy and security. When do the browser vendors say, we're doing this all together now? <laughs> well, I'd like to actually answer that. And the answer is almost never. But, but it usually, happens. It happens. But it usually happens. it's because someone with a lot of market share, like Chrome, says, I'm going to do X, and the other browsers will say, well, how are we going to catch up? Um, yeah, or or let well, them, way around. let them get the, the arrows. Um, I I think we were kind of out on a limb when we switched to Firefox three to making it much harder to click through a website, and we got a lot of flack from that from users. Um, we still actually do from people um, who think they know better what to get to their sites. But the, but the leak color hack was a perfect example of that. You guys all did it with them at the same place. Um, and we argued about it for, what, five or six years first? I count. <laughs> 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 um, I, mean, I still know the bug number. Um, <laughs> it's, it's a hard thing. I mean, we're, we're talking about the same thing with the uh, deprecating at SHA-1 asserts. Yeah, thank you. Um, <laughs> and, and Google right. kind of... Which is ridiculous, because the odds of somebody attacking SHA-1 versus 38% of your users will click through and get man in the middle by their country. Like, your Google's risk analysis there is so completely off by like nine orders of magnitude that it's silly, honestly. Well, I don't really but, compare them against each other, right? I mean, you can make progress in one area, and you don't have to always make it a trade-off against another. I mean, it doesn't deprecating shot one doesn't take away from whether people can proceed or not proceed through these. Right. Um, Look, we, we you have a deprecate MD5 roots uh, a few years back. Uh, Microsoft, I believe, took the lead on that one. Yeah, I'm not saying I'm against it. I'm just saying, like, all this focus on we're going to deprecate shot one. And it's like, I think, when um, right like today, somebody, you know. They have a crypto team, and they focus on crypto stuff. Right. And, and Adrienne's not on the crypto team. She focuses on other stuff like this. Um, and, and different people do what they do. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think you should also focus on just the fact that it's SHA-1 pilot. There's also a browser putting their teams in order. I think we have some crypto-related issue where we have to update crypto, what are the steps we have to go through? And so getting it up to the world and knowing what we need to do is also part of this exercise. It's not just focused on the one, but there's other things to learn from the exercise. I'm going to drag this back to your presentation. Uh, the, the, the numbers that changed, uh, did you look at uh, what changed? Like, when people switched to not clicking through, did they now switch to not clicking through for the attack cases and continue clicking through in the non-attack cases because they're kind of, like, was that the change or it was completely not related? Uh, we don't know. Okay. Because um, you do seem to have the data on, like, what was, how much was it timing, how much was it, like, clock skew, how much was it, uh, you know, antivirus. Like, Facebook did that amazing study on how many times is it antivirus, so clearly you can detect whether it's antivirus or whatever. Um, no, okay, so the, the Facebook study from, uh, in collaboration with CMU, where they're looking at what caused SSL errors, um, uh, was done differently. But yes, if, if we were to implement something like that inside Chrome, which actually we, we want to, and we're working on, it's in progress, um, we would be able to tell you the answer to that, but I, I don't have the answer to that, unfortunately. And also, I think even with that, like we can identify sort of something that really looked like false positives, and then most of the stuff's in the middle where we can't tell. So, it's always hard to be like, oh, that one's an attack, and that one's a false positive. And if we could do that, we would hard fail on the attack. No, no, I'm curious if the change was related to this, though. I, I'm, sure, I'm sure it's hard, but like, what change? Like, did user behavior change for specific cases? Or it's like, uh, you know, in general, randomly people learn from 38% to 62%. Yeah, it's, it's just an aggregate. I, I, don't, I don't know. Okay. We didn't track it according to different types of warnings. You guys have numbers on the adoption of HSDS globally? By region or? Uh, I don't remember it off the top of my head, sorry. So, <clears throat> I'm 
I'm often concerned about users understanding the real risk of being met in the middle. Um, so when I talk to people about email security and I say, okay, well, you know email's not secure. I'm like, okay, yeah, yeah. So, so you can read my email. Many people, including secure people, forget the fact that that also means you can spoof email. That means you can forge email. That means you can pretend to be someone else. And so I think in this exercise and some of the questions, it, it made me think that maybe, you know, there may not have been a focus on you know, helping educate users or finding a way to educate users on the fact that not only can they read my bank statements, they can transfer money, right? Actually doing things with my account, right? Making changes either to that web app or uh, giving me false information. So I don't know if, did, did you do any questions uh, to the users uh, just asking about the difference between those two things? Like seeing sensitive information versus making changes to my information. That's a great observation, and um, in fact, we sort of knowingly went into this. When we designed the warning, it only talks about the confidentiality guarantees, um, which is unfortunate because, say, you know, like, say you're some other website and you just don't want ad, like, you don't want your ISP to add ads to it, right? That has nothing to do really with privacy. In, in that case, it's mostly about integrity, and we don't really mention that. Um, so I don't. We didn't test it, but my guess would be that people would not figure that out, partly because we're not telling them. Yeah. Um, but I figure, you know, our guess was that privacy would be easier to explain, and we're still not doing a great job on that. So. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I, th I mean, I think some, with some websites, users won't be concerned at all about secrecy, right? The confidentiality aspect of 